Uh, great to be here. Uh, we're getting the post-lunch uh, buzz. Maybe everyone will fall asleep and you can say all sorts of controversial things and no one will, no one will pay attention. Um, so I'm going to give him a very brief introduction because he really doesn't need one, as the cliche goes, but also because we're short on time. Um, so uh, Chairman Walden is a native Oregonian. His family came to Oregon in a covered wagon by a wagon train, not a station wagon, but an actual wagon train in 1845. Um, served in, the, in both houses of the State House uh, in Oregon. Uh, and in 1998, uh, was elected to the US House. I'm cutting through a lot of history here very quickly. Um, he's married to the uh, very patient and virtuous Mylene for the past 35, almost 36 years. Uh, and they live in Hood River with their son, Anthony. He was chair of the NRCC from 2012 to 2016, where he racked up more, uh, a larger Republican majority in 80 years or something like, in history, okay, ever, ever. Uh, and he's been chair of uh, House Energy and Commerce, which has unlimited jurisdiction, I understand. It's, uh, sorry, I Chairman Goodlatch, except for you. Uh, sorry, made a little sliver there. Uh, since 2016. But as a former FCC commissioner, there are a few numbers and letters which are very important. W7EQI. That's his amateur radio license <laughs> call sign, which we all had to know at the, at the FCC. So um, why don't we uh, jump right into things? There have been a few things in the news cycle in the past uh, oh, 12 hours or 24 hours or so. Uh, one of which has to do with uh, apparently a National Security Council. Someone there has maybe recommended that for national security reasons, um, the next generation 5G uh, networks being built uh, here with private risk capital in the United States of America should be nationalized, uh, owned and operated, I guess, by the federal government. Um, so I don't know if you want to think about that a little longer. Or, uh, <laughs> If you have an opinion, or if no. you want to make some news. <laughs> or if I want to make, well, first of all, thank you. And I want to thank the App Challenge, Melissa, and everybody who works on that in terms of Congress and helping young people uh, take a real interest in coding and, uh, and in getting involved in, in this internet ecosystem that we all care so much about. And Robert, thank you for your service on the FCC. Uh, it was always a joy to have you before the committee uh, when I chaired the subcommittee on telecommunications and the internet, and uh, you're just a terrific public servant, and we appreciate your leadership and bringing your brain power to all these issues. Uh, 5G. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work over the last few years uh, to clear spectrum, to get it out into the public domain so we can expand out and be the, the, the center for innovation and, uh, and really increase connectivity across our land. Uh, when I learned about this issue, I think it was yesterday when it broke, um, Side note, didn't know. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of the first thing that came to mind, obviously we all care about the security of our networks and all of those issues and the security for the country. But the first thing that came to my mind was that hack that got into all the government's secure data called OPM. Now, a government that can't protect the data of its own employees, I, I just struggle with the notion it's gonna run a complete architecture and network uh, that will be hack free. Nor do I think it's in the best interest of uh, the kind of culture and economy we have here that believes in capital investment from the private sector. We're not Venezuela. Um, you know, we don't need to have the government run everything as the only choice. Now, we need to make sure these networks are safe and secure. We know there are bad actors out there and in different countries trying to infiltrate our networks. So I got that you got to have a partnership here for security of the networks. Government taking it over, controlling it is probably uh, clearly not the way to go. So I was just sent a text uh, saying, uh, from very good sources, saying that the White House is now saying they're not uh, considering nationalizing 5G. That's good. Um, nor 3G. Um, <laughs> or 4G. Nor, they, yeah, they actually, 4G, actually. They're I'm going for 2G. It. It's just it's <laughs> the next great thing. No, look, and, and I think we have to be able to have these discussions. I mean, we're having a little fun with this here. We need to have robust discussions. People need to kick out ideas. I get that, and, and I don't think it had elevated itself to a, where the White House had a position on this, by the way. And uh, I have every confidence that, you know, some of the other important elements of the government, the FCC, the NTIA, would have weighed in in the proper time and manner uh, in this. This is a, a leaked document, apparently, according to the uh, news reports. Um, it should also trouble us, frankly, this is the other part of me, that the National Security Council can't keep track of its own PowerPoints. 
Just saying. Okay. That's probably all I should say on that topic. <laughs> my, my staff says I'm out of time. Got to go. Off message. Yeah. Off message. So I think originally before this uh, this news sort of broke, um, with the State of the Union coming up, as we always have State of the Net uh, around the time of the State of the Union, and infrastructure being a hot topic, especially for 2018. Historically, infrastructure initiatives have been very bipartisan. Uh, by, uh, bias when I say that, thinking about Spectrum in particular, but it uh, could be a number of different things involving the internet, broadband in particular. And what would you like to see happen this year? And um, Well, I'd so. like to continue to build on our successes from the past. As you know, back to 2012, um, we were able to uh, free up, begin the process to free up the, the spectrum that went to auction, generated incredible receipts, unpredicted uh, in, in, in terms of amount. I think the AWS 3 was 44.4 billion. By the way, for those of you who keep score of a CBO, they said it had no value, gave us a zero score when it sold, 44 uh, billion dollars. And then the rest of the television auction uh, took place. And we've got to we've got to fix the repack piece to make sure it's properly funded, which was the commitment to broadcasters. So that is working its way through the the process right now. Um, I've been in in regular contact with, do I have to call him Assistant Secretary David Rettel? <laughs> you know, for those of the, you who don't know, he was uh, uh, the, the, the Chief Counsel on the Telecom Subcommittee for me for six years, and now I have to probably address him as the Honorable, too, but not in public. Um, you can also subpoena him if you I can, to. You know, yeah. I am waiting. <laughs> My team over here already has the letters <laughs> written. 38 questions for everything he says. Um, but. But to continue, so, so we did 2012, we did Spectrum Option, we, we're continuing to scrub Spectrum, because it is finite, to find what else is out there that we can bring to market. So that's one piece of this, is a continuing effort. Second, um, the FCC under Chairman Pai, who I want to give uh, great applause to, has been a great leader to work with, um, has identified that they should follow the law. This is shocking news in the nation's capital. There is a problem in the law that precludes him from legally putting the auction, some of the auction deposits proceeds into the proper place legally. The last administration just went ahead and did it. He's not going to do that. We literally have to change the law to say you can deposit here, there, wherever. So we have legislation to do that. Um, that's high on our list so we can proceed in regular order with more spectrum auction. Second, we have a hearing uh, tomorrow starting at 10. Uh, we have 25 pieces of legislation, ideas from Republicans, Democrats, Republicans and Democrats, Democrats and Republicans, <laughs> on infrastructure. <clears throat> and a lot of it has to do with getting the government's processes out of the analog age into the digital age. And by that, I mean streamlining how you can move forward and getting the government to move at the pace of innovation in the high-tech sector. Now, I'll give you a, a, an example, and I'm going to refer to my notes because sometimes you get fact-checked in this business. Um, Crown Castle. Crown Castle uh, was a wireless infrastructure company, and in 2016 was looking to expand their tower site, which is in a parking lot, by a 14 by 10 area adjacent to its existing tower. They had to prove there was no adverse effect in doing that in a parking lot. They had two dozen entities to work through. It took them five months to complete and thousands of dollars just to add 140 square feet around the tower they already have. So my friend and colleague John Shimkus has introduced a bill to make clear that neither the FCC nor any of the entities that it regulates should be required to perform these reviews in existing rights of way or where an existing facility is being expanded by no more than 30 feet in any direction. It's things like that that stand in the way of the build out we all want. And in our rural areas, this is especially important. A district such as mine, it's even more important, where 55% of the land in the district I represent, which, by the way, is two-thirds of the land mass of Oregon, bigger than eight state east of the Mississippi, with the exception of Michigan. Fred Upton reminds me because of the lake. <laughs> but with all the siting requirements, it's not that you want to avoid the environmental requirements. It's just you need to be able to expedite the processes. So it does. I, I had a tiny little town of less than probably 150 people spend well over three years trying to get permits to put four power poles on Bureau of Land Management land so they could finally get three-phase power into this town. Four power poles. So, I mean, these are the things we're going to look at to see how do we expedite the process going forward. And then we want to make sure that the mapping's done right. When the uh, 
uh, when, when the Obama administration did the stimulus, they pushed the money out the door before they knew where the maps were for whether the areas were served or underserved. We want to get the mapping right. Um, the limited federal resource that does get spent on broadband build out should be spent in areas where it's least economically attractive to the private sector. In other words, we don't need to overbuild and we need to build where there isn't service or where there's minimal service. 39% of rural areas in America, some 23 million people lack access to modern day high speed internet. That's where the public investment should go. So we want to make sure we got a whole series of bills to look at all of those issues and, and more. So you come from a uniquely rural area. You just said how, how large it is and how um, diffuse the population is, right? A lot, a lot of people, uh, or very few people spread over a large area. What do you think are some of the better solutions for rural America? You talked about removing regulatory barriers um, at the state and federal or, and local level, uh, but to what else can be done? More spectrum? Uh, well, you know, options? you're always going to need the backhaul, so you need to be able to get fiber out across these areas. <clears throat> and using existing rights away makes a lot of sense where it's possible. Um, trying to streamline the siting process uh, where, wherever you can. Um, but also, I think, with the new wireless technology, perhaps the new satellite technology, the, the ability to move more data, um, through existing systems uh, makes sense. Let's face it, in some of these areas, I, I've got some counties where there's one person for every nine miles of power line. You know, that's probably not going to be economically achievable by connecting each house with a cable or, or fiber. But what you can do now from a, a wireless standpoint, and when you get to 5G and get 100x of, of the throughput you can get now with LTE, that's going to change lives. And so I think the faster we can get L the 5G developed here and then out, um, removing these, anal I'll call them analog impediments, um, and then getting the streamlined part with the federal agencies. And the Trump administration uh, issued uh, a couple of proclamations directing the federal agencies to try and streamline their siting efforts. And again, it's not to, to void any of the environmental laws, it's just to try and speed up the process. Terrific. So uh, we look forward to Dave Riddle giving us more federal spectrum to maybe auction for, you know, and also have license and other By Thursday. By Thursday. Okay, good to know. So why don't we I pivot? I have a subpoena. <laughs> so uh, net neutrality. Um, I know we're short on time here, um, but uh, how does the FCC's recent uh, action affect uh, uh, broadband rollout, but also legislative priorities? And y you know, uh, it affects it. It's affected it for years. Um, I remember sitting down uh, in my capital office with uh, Senator Thune and Cong then Chairman Upton and myself and Tom Wheeler um, asking Tom not to proceed and give Congress an opportunity to legislate. And we thought we were moving down a pretty good path that way and then that got reversed. And he went ahead with the Title II regulation. The effect of that was we had real difficulty trying to find any part bipartisan agreement on anything that came anywhere near the FCC um, since then, because one side says it's oh, all net neutrality. That's like, no, actually, we need to modernize the FCC. We need to do other things. And so we're marching through that. Look, we ought to be able to come to find common ground to prevent the bad behaviors that we, all of us can agree upon, throttling, blocking. Uh, we're going to have a hearing on paid prioritization. Uh, because that gets into how the internet works today. Um, you know, you have, in effect, paid prioritization, CDNs. You have uh, a situation where traffic's prioritized today. 9-11 calls should be prioritized over watching some crazy cat video on YouTube, right? Voice packets over data packets. I mean, there are things that happen today in the management of the internet that make sense. And, and I don't think they're fully understood by the public or, or my colleagues or even myself. I mean, that's why we do hearings. That's why we ask for the input. We want to get the policy right, but what we need to get certainty. Certainty will drive more investment. Uh, if we just continue on with um, litigation versus litigation, administration versus administration, America will move further back and back in, in innovation. And I don't want that to happen. I want, I want broadband investment to go up, not go flat. And I think you're seeing that with the tax code changes and other things we can do. We can drive more investment in broadband build-out. Um, and it's done at the private sector, more than the public sector. You know, you think about the, the, the huge amount of coverage over the uh, ARRA investment in the Obama administration was $7 billion. The private sector every year does about 80, 75, 77, 78 uh, 
$1.8 billion a year. So, I mean, that's where it's at. That's what's going to build out. Um, and we need to cement that partnership, move forward, and get connectivity everywhere we can at high speed. So I'd like to see us uh, move forward in a bipartisan way on the issues where we can find agreement. I think the CRA is uh, dead on arrival at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it's great politics for some, but it's not going to, it's not, even if it passes the House and the Senate, I can't imagine it'll end up with a DJT on the, on the paperwork. And so why don't we come together today, as I've tried to do for the last five years before the net neutrality rules were implemented by the Wheeler uh, administration or FCC, and, and legislate in this space. And so I'm, I'm asking all parties, let's do it. I've had draft proposals on the table since uh, probably 2014, 2015. So part of what you're saying is the CRA effort is not the legislative solution that some are advertising it to be. All that does really just... No, it's just a bulldozer. It takes you back to where it was and then says the FCC can't do any activity in this space, most likely, which may not be what people want. And beyond that, um, you know, you're seeing a growing debate out there, including at Davos, where some pretty surprising characters said it's more than just the Internet service providers that may need to have a discussion about net neutrality, it may be the edge providers, it may be the Facebooks and the Amazons and all that. And the more you learn about how they operate and their algorithms work and the trolls and the, you know, how many followers do you really have? And how many did you just buy? And is somebody monetizing all that, by the way? You know, you, you go back, you're in the museum here, and the great newspaper business, they have to certify how many readers they have and publish that because that's what they sell advertising rates based upon. You think about today's information world, are we getting scammed in this market when you buy? Who knows? I don't know. But we know there are bots out there that pretend to be people, and there are followers out there that don't exist, and all this is getting monetized. So I think there's a role for the FTC, the FCC, and Congress. So is this an area where uh, your committee will be doing some yep. further investigations? Absolutely. On, on the state of the market, to the state of the net overall. Absolutely. Because here, here's my view. You've got to put the consumer first. And if you put the consumer first, it means you have a market you can trust in, and that will drive innovation and competition, which should lower prices and expand choices for consumers. And if there's bad behavior, we will go after it. I don't care who it is. Um, and the Energy and Commerce Committee has a pretty good record on doing that, uh, going back Republican and Democrat chairs. Excellent. So you mentioned earlier the uh, broadcaster repack process. This is uh, in the wake of the 600 megahertz auction, the Spectrum Act of 2012, which uh, you and I worked on a little bit together when I was at the commission as you were writing it. Um, and uh, it's a complex endeavor, uh, what the FCC is about to undertake. And you mentioned before there might need to be some more help or some more thought in that area. I wanted you to sort of elaborate. You know, the commitment that was made to broadcasters when that was being put together is if, if you're not part of the auction, we're going to do our best to make sure you're not harmed, not harmed in terms of your overall viewership or that you should have to pay some price and penalty just because you're licensed and you're getting moved around. So additionally, in the legislation we put forward, we had $3 billion was the identified figure of what we thought it would cost to do the repack. That got negotiated down between the parties to $1.75 billion, and now, guess what? The number probably is about $3 billion. Bucks. Well, now we've allocated all the auction proceeds, so we have to go find money to make this up. We need to make this up, not only to keep our word, but also to grease the skids of getting the repack done. Public broadcasters are running this. Public television stations are running into a problem because they're only, the FCC, I think, is only laying out like 80% of the money at a time, and so there are questions about where you can go, what you can commit to, and all that, and what are you going to get reimbursed, and we don't need that. And so I'm working really hard to figure out the funding stream and make any other associated changes we need to to make sure the repack can continue on time because you're on a really tight timeline here, 39 months, and you got tower uh, issues with there's a limited supply of people that climb and move and, and erect towers. That's an issue we've looked at in the committee. We don't need anything that stands in the way of this progress because what stands in the way there is, is building out the new networks and the higher speeds and throughputs and coverage areas. So we need all this to stay on track and work. It's what the investors in the spectrum paid for was the spectrum on a timeline. They predicated their business model on that. Broadcasters were promised that they wouldn't incur any, any losses. And Congress now needs to step up and true this up, and I think we'll have an opportunity to do that. And do you think that could be done on a bipartisan uh, basis? Yeah, I hope so. I don't, I don't, you know, Frank Pallone, who I've, I've developed a really good working relationship with on many issues, even when we disagree, it's, it's uh, amicable. 
Um, and I know he's got a bill authorizing this. Um, it's always easy to authorize, by the way. It's hard to appropriate from an authorizing standpoint. So appropriators get funny about that. <laughs> but we got to find the money. And I, I, we're, we're shoulder to shoulder on that. Very good. So I know we're, we're starting to run out of time, but uh, the recent false alarm in Hawaii uh, brought uh, attention to all of our emergency alerts and even a conversation regarding 911 and next generation 911. And what would you like to see happen? Uh, well, we'll have area? the commission before the committee next week. Is that right? Uh, the full commission. I got to look here. February. February. <laughs> all right. Another full false alarm. <laughs> false alarm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guarantee you a couple of things. One, you mentioned I'm an amateur radio operator, although I'm not active too much. Um, two, I guarantee you I'm the only chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee that's actually wired in uh, an emergency alert system or two or three in radio stations because my wife and I owned radio stations for 20 plus years and I pretended to be an engineer at times. Um, and so I know a little bit about that and I go back far enough to remember when it was the emergency broadcast system and it was an orange book that slid right there in the control room next to the operator and inside was a pink, I think it was a pink envelope that had authentication codes in it in case of a national uh, emergency. And those got changed out, I'll say, every month. There was a period of time, you got a new envelope, you destroyed the old one, you never opened it. I don't know what was going to happen. It's like ripping the thing off your mattress, I think. But, <laughs> but seriously, I mean, this was very well thought out. I cannot imagine a scenario where me sitting at AM 1340 KIHR goes, hey, push the wrong button and we have a nuclear, a nuclear attack coming. I just don't know how that would have happened. Um, and so I think this needs evaluation. I talked to Chairman Pai that night, um, and, and we discussed it. It's a matter of great seriousness. There could have been loss of life as a result of this because, you know, we had, we had, we had an interesting thing when, when I was in the radio business. Fortunately, I had a retired guy who had come back and worked, just wanted to do Saturday morning shift. And uh, Tom was a great guy, cool head, and they were doing a mock drill in Oregon and the whole shtick was that one of the major main stem dams across the Columbia River had been breached. Now, if that happens, Portland's under a whole bunch of water. So they're going through all the drills and emergency casualty stuff. This is all a drill. And he gets the call saying, OK, now it's your turn to activate the emergency alert system and notify people of this disaster. He said, OK, thanks. No, you have to do that. He said, no, no, no. I don't think I'm going to push the button and actually go on the air and say Bonneville Dam's been breached. I think that's sort of Orson Welles stuff. And, uh, and so he refused to do it. But it can get to that level. And I think wherever we are, we've got to be cognizant that safeguards are in place, and especially in these treacherous times, dangerous times, in places like Hawaii or Guam or somewhere, that, that, that there's better command and control. So on the 50th anniversary of 9-11, on these events happening, I look forward to working with our first responder community and our broadcasters and states and the FCC to see what went wrong and then how do we make sure it doesn't happen again. How are we on time? Uh, good for questions. One or two questions? Are you, are you uh, we want sure. to entertain one or two from the yeah. from I'll the take them, you answer them. Works well. uh, over here, we'll start over here first. So yeah, I'll tell you what, yeah. I apologize, I should have said that. We do have microphones, and there are people watching on the internets, apparently. I don't know why today. I thought this was all off the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of tweets. Thank you, Congressman and Commissioner, uh, for a, a very enlightening presentation. Um, I was encouraged to hear your discussions regarding uh, infrastructure. And when Is we talk about who you're with? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Bill Shooting. I'm here with uh, Connect Americans Now. Um, and when we, we talk about the digital divide in rural America, we often hear a lot about public investment, uh, but little about specific technologies that will deliver broadband to underserved areas. Um, and there's some stakeholders, including the coalition Connect Americans Now, who are advocating for the use of TV white space technology to play a role in this mission. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that TV white space spaces should be a part of the solution? And then, they, if so, what, what steps do Congress and the FCC yeah. need to take to ensure their internet service providers? You know, I, I think they can be. So as an as a old radio guy, um, I want to make sure we don't have interference. That's the first thing. You know, w wherever you are in the spectrum, we went through this with light squared and, you know, all the issues that followed from there. You want to always be pushing out and maximizing use of the spectrum, but you don't want to create unintended consequences 
um, and in this case could be uh, uh, interference with existing users. And so that's something we asked the GAO to look at. That's something we're continuing to investigate. Um, I'm not opposed at all to it as long as there isn't um, some sort of interference issue. That has, to be, that has to be first and foremost. But look, we, we're scouring every bit of spectrum we can to do the kinds of things and, and that you're talking about, as well as look at unlicensed, what the appropriate amount of that is. It's a tension we had in the 2012 Act. Um, we, we're going to try and get, you know, uh, millimeter spectrum out there. I mean, there, there's a lot that we're doing. There was a time, I would say, in 2012, and I, I may be wrong on this, but where we thought some of the upper end spectrum, the 5 gig and all that, hey, and people weren't really sure what that'd be used for and did it have much value. And now we know that's like some of the, the new beachfront, if you will. And so uh, we're, we're looking at how do we maximize use of that as long as there's an interference issue. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, sure. Real quick, uh, right here. Let's wait for the mic, and uh, if you could identify yourself and who you're with. Yeah, that's helpful. Should have said that to begin with. Gary Arlen from Arlen Communications. Can you say anything about any opportunity to update the uh, 1996 uh, Telecommunication Act? In other words, reform. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I started an effort on that when I chaired the Telecommunications and Internet uh, Subcommittee. We did a very extensive uh, information gathering project, uh, ComAct update we called it, and had a lot of good input on how to do that. Um, it was my hope to do kind of a major rewrite. That, as I mentioned earlier, kind of collided with the big net neutrality in the room and, and kind of precluded our ability to, to move forward on a big one. So what we're doing is kind of looking piece by piece by piece. I, I, as, a, uh, as a member of Congress, we, uh, jurisdiction over an agency, I also think we need to look at the FCC's functions, how it works today, and modernize it. We always have that obligation over all our agencies. We're doing that with the Department of Energy. We should do it with the FCC. So there's kind of that piece. Then I try and look at, at the statutory responsibilities the commission has. And, and I think we're basically carving those up piece at a time and, and program at a time. So I, we live in, a, in, in obviously a different era than when the 96 Act was written. Um, the market has changed dramatically, um, and, and so we need to look at these different programs piece by piece, and, and that's what we're doing. So I, I would not look for a comprehensive uh, redo of the 96 Act. I think instead you'll see programmatic by pro program by program evaluations and, and changes going forward. And, and I should say, under Marsha Blackburn, it's, 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 she's terrific chair of that subcommittee. She's done a great job and uh, you know, is, is full of vim and vigor and fire and, and wants to get things done, so. So Colonel Tom Parker was Elvis Presley's manager and he always said, leave the crowd wanting more. So we should have stopped Elvis that. has left the building, ladies and gentlemen. Please, please give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.